everybody how to get here. Uh, if you're walking and you're lost, it's pretty easy to find, but, uh, but we like it. Um, Krish actually started uh, Bell Labs in 1980 um, and had a very, uh, very successful career with a number of companies, held executive positions in Uptown Lucent and some VCs. We brought him back. You know, he's now our chief technology officer and the president of ATT Labs. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy hearing from him. He's going to tell you a little bit about some of the things we're doing. The big theme for all of us is that we're taking things that are previously very proprietary and close, we're opening them up. And also taking processes that I know you and I kind of grew up in and around in Bell Labs, we're trying to speed them up, trying to speed up cycle time and trying to get some of the innovation that we build out to market market. So with that, interest, interest yeah, my thank boss. You. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Good. Those of us who work for Ted know that he's the real boss. I'd right? <laughs> <laughs> well, your PC off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you can turn our PC off because he's the chief security officer. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, good to be here. And we just want to get into the meat of the show, which is really the demonstrations. We have a wide range of at and uh, employees and partners, uh, researchers, people who work in our foundry. They're very, very eager to show you what they've been working on. What I want to do in my uh, original uh, short presentation here is to just set it up for you, just to kind of tell you what to expect as you look at these demonstrations, but more importantly, kind of try to get a thread through it. Why do we think we're working on things that are around the corner? The big challenge for us is where is the network going over the next 10 years? We do know what happened to the network over the past 10 years, and most of us in this industry will <coughs> gladly admit that we didn't see the network going where it did over the last 10 years. So the challenge for us now is to anticipate from a research standpoint where we should place our bets, where we should make our investments. We have great minds, uh, we have uh, the best in the industry, we hire uh, researchers from the best colleges. Uh, I truly believe you give them a problem, they can solve it. The challenge for Ed and myself is to make sure they're working on the right problem. So we also would like your feedback. to we'll see if you think we're working on the right things. That's, that's good uh, feedback to us. With that, let me kick this off. Uh, our theme today... I must be doing something wrong. Okay, there you go. Just, all right, our theme today is to talk a little bit about the connected life. So our vision about where the network goes, what happens to the network, how people use the network over the ten, next 10 years is all about a connected life. And that clearly is a trend you see with what has happened. Uh, between 1995 and 2010, over a span of 15 years, if you'd asked anybody in 1995 who was working on mobility, they would never have guessed that 10, 15 years later, people would be doing what they do with the mobility network today. And that really is at the right end of the spectrum. So I drew that evolution chart. That's really uh, somebody who walks on four legs eventually walking upright. Uh, that's what that's supposed to convey. But mobility in that context was a very simple task. All you had to do was make sure that when people wanted to talk, they could talk wherever they were, if they were moving or if they were stationary. But today that same problem has translated because of a lot of convergence that has happened into a full-fledged social networking problem, which essentially is mobility, but the ability of the user to place content, to retrieve content, and to do something with that content wherever they are. And that's a far more complex problem that we face. And then on top of that, when you throw in the aspect of security, you can see how difficult it is. In fact, Ed and his group here are constantly monitoring the hacking aspects, the security aspects, how to make sure that the network is secure, especially when it's that open, as well as something that's that functional. And this problem only gets more complex as you look at the next decade. But before we solve the problems of the world, we've got to solve this problem, moving the advances, uh, advancing the slides faster. But let me, let me get to this particular slide. Uh, this is a slide of convergence that conveys a lot of things that have happened over the last decade. Firstly, there's been the convergence with the handset. You do know that the handset does a lot more today than what it did five, six years ago. 
there's also a convergence of service. There's no reason why, you know, on the handset, you should get off of one screen if you want to do texting, or you should get off of one screen if you want to watch video streaming. So that's the second aspect of it. The third aspect of convergence is the business models. Virtually anybody who uses the internet today uses the internet in the context of a business model that's converging, that gives them the potential to optimize their, their investment and get maximum revenue. So the challenge we face is in a converging one network world, what is it that we can do so that our customers, uh, most of you who use our networks, can get the most out of the network? So we have a massive uh, innovation project uh, at at and at and Labs has uh, approximately 7,000 employees. Uh, in its heyday, the labs had 20,000 employees. That was when Ed and I joined uh, Bell Laboratories in the early 80s. Uh, of the 7,000 employees, uh, roughly 5 to 10 percent of them are working on advanced research projects. And outside of that, we also have several partner initiatives. Uh, let me start out with uh, something called the AT&T Fast Pitch. Every year we do several outreach efforts. We'll go to areas of innovation like Silicon Valley, Israel, sometimes here in the Northeast. Uh, we will invite people, typically entrepreneurs, to present us their stories. What are they working on? Uh, so we give them an opportunity to present to us. And if it's interesting, if it looks like there's something we can do with their innovation, we move it into the AT&T Foundry. The AT&T Foundry has, um, uh, it's more like a gateway. We have uh, something that looks like this. If you go to any one of our foundries, it's open. Anyone can come in. They come in, work with our teams. They also connect to our network, and they get to prototype their application, test it. So in a sense, it's like the foundries of the Industrial Revolution, except that we are playing with software instead of playing with metal smithing, for example. And, and the Foundry is a very innovative concept. We launched it 18 months ago. Sanjay Makwan, who's here, he's a member of the labs, was instrumental in its launch. And if you have any questions for him, I'm sure he'd be able to answer those. But more importantly, as we look in the next uh, four or five years, we have plans to launch more foundries, maybe one right here in this location, uh, that will typically look at one particular aspect, perhaps security. Um, let me move on here. Uh, just a quick word on the labs. Um, there's an excellent book on the labs that's come out called The Idea Factory, and that book actually traces the history of the labs. But we have a rich history, several uh, inventions, uh, several Nobel Prizes along the way. But what we've typically been focused on here lately is not so much moving the science of the business by finding new inventions, but more how do we integrate, because it's a different world for innovation today. Uh, innovation happens on multiple frontiers. You have large groups of very smart people, small groups, large groups. It's an open environment. How do we bring the innovations together to leverage it on your platform, which in our case is the AT&T network. And it's a model of innovation that Google's following, Facebook's following, everyone has a massive platform. The the way you can get the ability of the platform enhanced quickly and what you can do with it and get more people to use the platform is really the golden key, so to speak. And that's what our innovation program is all about. Uh, a quick word on the TIP uh, program here. What we typically do is uh, inside the company we have nearly 300,000 employees. These employees are a rich storehouse of knowledge. So we would pose challenges. The challenges can come from our customers. The challenges can come from our executives. It can be an idea or a suggestion that one of the employees had. In fact, today, as you walk around see the demonstrations, you'll, you'll see some of the researchers tell you that it was a TIP idea. And that's what TIP is all about. If you have a wonderful idea, it gets quickly assessed. We create the funding for you. We, we, we grease the skid, so to speak, for you to set aside a space, time, some facilities, and some funding, and then you go implement your idea and see if there's something you can do with it. Uh, won't go through the statistics, but you can see what several of the projects today are tip projects. And feel free to ask the researchers how the idea went from a seed of an idea to where it is today. 
I talked about the foundry, uh, three locations uh, for good reason. We centered them, uh, uh, Palo Alto and Ranana, in, in fact, because of the large entrepreneur networks and startup, uh, the startup environment that resides there, but also in Plano, Texas, uh, not too far from our headquarters in Dallas. And the foundry, uh, we've already launched 40 services. There were ideas that came to the foundry that rapidly got developed into a service that was then launched on the network. And many more to come as we expand our foundry network. Uh, lastly, I'll talk a little bit about opening up the network. Ed uh, mentioned it as part of his introduction. What you see on the left is the way we used to do it. So we'd have a network. <clears throat> we would build dedicated infrastructure on the network. We would build a dedicated platform, for example, if you want a special service that would be built as a dedicated platform on the network. And then we would do a finished product on it. And that is the product we would go out and market. Now, on the other hand, over the last couple of years, we've transformed this into a totally different structure. And part of this structure is to firstly identify parts of the network that could be opened up to third parties. And the third party is really any developer, a partner, even our own developers who develop AT&T finished products. And they access the network through what we call application programming interface. And this is done very carefully because we have to worry about hacking, we have to worry about security, but we also have to worry about network utility and make sure we expose the right things so that people can get something out of the network. Once we've done that, we have a shared infrastructure cloud uh, capability that we are standing up even as we speak. Uh, cloud is basically a sea of computers, a sea of storage. You can grab any computer, you can grab any element of storage, and you can build in software what we call a virtual machine that executes a process. It's a highly modular, highly flexible structure and, and a rapid way of building something on top of a network that provides you the connectivity. And we have just started and launched a major platform effort. Uh, the next step you'll see here in the next 12 to 18 months, more and more of our uh, services as well as partner services stood up on top of this cloud infrastructure. So the cloud infrastructure is also open through an API interface and over and above that, we could have a unique shared platform. An example of what you'll see today is AT&T Watson. AT&T Watson is a very complicated, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I'd really like for you to see how all of this comes together in the AT&T Watson. Uh, it's a speech engine, it's a machine uh, that does human-to-human uh, -human translations. Uh, I'll, we'll get into that, but we have uh, several researchers who spent a good two decades of their research career enhancing and developing this particular system. And that would be an example of a shared platform that stands on top of our cloud infrastructure. Okay, let me uh, talk about the last uh, few notes. I'll skip this example, but you'll see this uh, as you walk around. The AT&T family map is a good example. A developer, developer can come in, they kind of access our location APIs. Based on the location APIs, they can create an application that allows you to map where your family members are, and that's the finished product that, uh, that's offered on AT&T's uh, platform. Okay, let me spend a few minutes on this, because this is uh, something we're announcing today. Uh, in my opinion, it's a great achievement of scientific endeavor. Uh, more than a million staff hours, research staff hours, have gone into it. 600 plus patents and counting, 25, 30 years of research. Uh, we've developed a system that literally can take any speech, uh, element in six different languages and translate it from one to the other. It's a very complex endeavor if you really look at it, not just the speech part of it, but also language, getting the right uh, syntax, getting the right context of what is being said, translating it so machines can have intelligent conversation with humans and our machines. 
And I really believe over the next 10 years, this is where the network is going. More of this, you, if, you, if you can't solve the problem of reach, which is what we are solving today, we are building out a wireless network that reaches everybody. And once you've solved the problem of reach, people want to do something with the network that's more than just making a phone connection or accessing text messages. And this is where this level of intelligence in the network makes a big difference. Now, uh, Maz and Gilbert and his team are here today. They'll talk all about it. And if you're not careful, they'll talk you all the way till the sun sets. So be careful. Uh, and, I, and I admire that because they, they really believe in what they've done and they're proud of what they've done. We have a whole range of other capabilities that will follow the speech engine. We'll do the same thing. We will test it in perfect. Uh, the speech engine, for example, has 90, 95% accuracy. That's unheard of. Uh, in my humble opinion, the next best competitor is probably more in the 80s or less. So it's an incredible amount of endeavor. And to get the last 2 3% of improvement and efficiency requires a lot of work in the right areas. We have several other such platform capabilities that we can expose in the network. Uh, certainly identity and security, a big aspect when things are so complex and attackers are around everywhere, uh, uh, lurking, so to speak. Uh, we have data analysis and personalization. Uh, network optimization is a branch in which if you really want to get to someone very quickly and the network's congested, the network will find a way to get you there. And that is another class of sophisticated uh, capabilities in the network that show up as the network does more and more things for people. And lastly, a uh, whole family of next generation communication services. You'll see a lot of research today that's related to touch, to gesture. And I, I do believe the next big frontier in terms of how humans interact with the network is around doing simple things that humans love to do. Humans are lazy by definition. So they want to do things in a simple, lazy way, and the network's got to step up and be ready to, to accommodate that. And there's a whole range of demonstrations today in our recent program you'll see that pertain to that class of services. OK, on that note, I will uh, conclude my opening remarks. Uh, one broad theme, the connected life. The connected life opens a whole new frontier. Uh, for people, the network has to do a whole lot of things so that that frontier uh, can be used by ordinary people in ordinary ways. There's a whole lot of research that goes behind it, and most of our demonstrations today carry that common theme. Okay? So thank you very much. Enjoy your day, and uh, feel free to ask questions. We have all uh, very capable people, much smarter than I am, and they're going to walk you through what they've been working on. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>